Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Morell, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly zoonoses and One Health updates call on March 3rd, 2021. Next slide, please. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Next slide. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Describe two key points from each presentation. Describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics. Identify an implication for animal and human health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats. And identify two new resources from CDC partners. Next slide. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, with the exception of Dr. Deborah Thompson, who, she wish, who wishes to disclose that she will speak about the organization she founded and may mention her science communication book. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is one health 2021. To receive free CE for, for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by April 5th, 2021. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted at cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu slash 2021 slash march.html within 30 days. To receive free CE for this web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by April 6, 2023. Next slide. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Casey Barton Baravesh, Director of CDC's One Health Office, will share some news and updates. You may begin when you're ready. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for today's Zohu call. We really appreciate your help in spreading the word about the Zohu call by sharing the website link with your colleagues from human, animal, plant, environment, and other relevant sectors. Before our presentations, I'd like to share a few One Health COVID-19 updates and highlights from today's Zohu call email newsletter. If you're not yet subscribed, please use the link at the top of the main Zohu call webpage so you can stay informed. CDC's response to the COVID-19 outbreak continues to evolve. Please check CDC's website for the latest guidance and resources, including information about keeping people as well as pets and other animals safe and healthy during the pandemic. The CDC One Health Federal Interagency COVID-19 Coordination Group, or OFIC, is continuing to meet to bring together representatives from 21 key federal agencies for regular meetings so we can share news and updates, collaborate on the One Health aspects of COVID-19, and develop joint guidance on aspects of COVID-19 relevant to the health of people, the environment, and animals, including companion animals, wildlife and zoo animals, and livestock or other production animals like mink. We also hold a monthly One Health Partners COVID-19 webinar to provide news, key updates, and guidance and resources for partners, including public health officials, animal health officials, veterinarians, industry partners, pet owners, and others. And our next call will be on March 16th. 
please email onehealth at cdc.gov to receive more information on how to join our One Health Partners COVID-19 webinar. At this time, CDC is aware of 223 confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 infection in animals from 25 countries, including cases in pet dogs and cats, large cats and gorillas in zoo settings, a pet ferret and a wild caught mink, which was caught around a US mink farm that was confirmed with SARS-CoV-2. There's also um, 420 mink farms with SARS-CoV-2 from 11 countries around the world. Looking at the slide here in the United States, we're aware of 135 animals that have tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. This includes 67 cats and 46 dogs, as well as multiple zoo animals, including large cats and gorillas, and that wild mink I mentioned that was caught around a U.S. mink farm. Looking at information on mink farms in the U.S., we've had 16 mink farms affected with SARS-CoV-2 in four states. Um, so we wanted to mention that as well. And the latest animal case numbers and guidance for farmers and veterinarians and others are available through a variety of websites that we'll include in our resources. At this time, there's no evidence that animals play a significant role in spreading SARS-CoV-2 to people. And based on limited information available to date, the risk of animals spreading COVID-19 to people is considered to be low. More studies are needed to understand if and how different animals could be impacted by COVID-19 and their role in the transmission dynamics of this virus between animals and people. We'll continue to keep sharing timely updates as the knowledge around COVID-19 and animals evolves. Next slide, please. CDC has released new resources for healthcare professionals treating botulism and USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service or APHIS is providing additional guidance on their website to help online buyers and sellers comply with US laws when they import seeds and live plants for planting from other countries. So be sure to check out those links. Next slide. We also wanted to highlight some recent publications of interest. First is a new publication on animal reservoirs and hosts for emerging alpha coronaviruses and beta coronaviruses. Next is livestock associated methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus colonization and infection among livestock workers and veterinarians, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Also, a summary of possible multi-state enteric or intestinal disease outbreaks in 2016, and a few other articles shown here as well. Next slide, please. We wanted to highlight some upcoming events of interest, including the Consumer Food Safety Education Virtual Conference, which is taking place online March 10th through the 12th. You can check out the links here for other information. Next slide, please. We've also got a new outbreak to highlight. That includes a salmonella outbreak linked to tiny turtles and a listeria outbreak linked to queso fresco consumption. Please visit CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. Our next call is gonna take place on April 7th. So please be sure to email topic suggestions for future presentations, as well as news from your organization that you'd like for us to share to Zohu call at cdc.gov and we're happy to include that in our newsletter. I'll now turn the call back over to Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. You may submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You may also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. Next slide. Our first presentation, One Water, Estimating the Burden of Waterborne Disease in the United States is by Sarah Collier. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be talking with you about our work estimating the burden of waterborne disease in the United States. Next slide, please. So you might be wondering how this topic is connected to One Health. Next slide. 
But of course, environmental health is one of many One Health issues, as you all know, I'm sure. Next slide, please. And so to expand on that, I'd like to start by just taking a second to think about all the ways that you might have interacted with water today. You might have drunk a glass of water or maybe some coffee or tea brewed with water. You might have turned on the hot water tap and taken a shower. Maybe you watered some houseplants or gave water to your pets. You have probably flushed the toilet today, but you might not have taken a second to be grateful for the water that enabled you to flush. Um, and maybe you were really on top of things and you got in some exercise by swimming this morning. Or you might be in a building that's heated, cooled, or humidified using water. Or maybe you're lucky to live by an ocean or a river or a stream. Okay, next slide. So I think you're getting my point, which is that we're surrounded by water in both our built environment and in the outside world. And that the health of these environments is connected to the health of people. Next slide. So despite being surrounded by water, many people think of waterborne disease as cases of cholera or typhoid and something in the past. And I don't know if there are any other um, children of the 80s out there who remember this early computer game, Oregon Trail. Next slide. So we felt that it was time to update people's mental picture of waterborne disease. Next slide, please. So one of the things that uh, people might not have considered is that our mostly safe and mostly reliable water supply has led to the increasing use of water in complex ways. And here are some of the ways that we see waterborne disease transmission in the United States. Next slide. We have complicated plumbing, heating, and cooling systems in large buildings, including buildings with sick people in them, like hospitals. Next slide. We rely on water for lots of medical uses, including for dialysis and for ventilators. Next slide, please. We have more leisure time to swim in increasingly complicated recreational water venues. Next slide, please. And we use water as an integral part of agriculture and the food production process. Next slide, please. So we needed data to help us describe and quantify this new, more complex era of waterborne disease. Next slide, please. Moving to our methods. Next slide. We know that there are many diseases associated with water, but for this burden estimate, we decided to set ourselves a manageable task and selected 17 diseases with available data that we knew were transmitted in the United States through water, listed here. And I'm not going to go through and read all of them, but I'll give you a second to kind of absorb the diseases that we assessed. Next slide. And we focused on five outcomes, illnesses, emergency department visits, hospitalizations, deaths, and healthcare costs. Next slide, please. So um, co colleagues in foodborne disease led by Elaine Scallon had published a really influential foodborne burden estimate in 2011. And we based our approach on the methods that they developed. Next slide, please. So like Scallon and colleagues, we used a surveillance-based approach where we used a series of multipliers to go from the number of reported cases in a surveillance system to the total number of cases. Next slide, please. And finally, similar to Scallon, we generated uncertainty intervals for each estimate. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna to have to gloss over this part and most of the methods a little bit. But if you're interested in exactly how the miracle occurs in step two there, I'm always happy to talk more. Next slide, please. So moving to our results. Next slide, please. What did we find? Um, we found that over 7 million cases, including 600,000 emergency department visits, 120,000 hospital stays, and 7,000 deaths, resulting in $3.3 billion in healthcare costs, are due to waterborne disease each year in the United States. So let's step through these large numbers together. Next slide, please. So there were 7.2 million cases of disease. Next slide. In case you were wondering how 
these illnesses break down, the majority were otitis externa, which is also known as swimmer's ear, followed by illnesses caused by norovirus, and then giardia and cryptosporidium. Next slide, please. There were 600,000 emergency department visits. Next slide. And again, the vast majority of the emergency department visits are due to otitis externa, 570,000 of the ex estimated 600,000. Next slide, please. So moving to the more serious health outcomes in which hospitalization occurs, 120,000 hospital stays were due to waterborne disease. Next slide, please. And this brings us to the topic of biofilm. Next slide. So you might not realize that that slimy sludge that you can find in um, plumbing systems or really anywhere that has a consistent source of moisture is a biofilm. It's a, a whole microbial community. Um, and biofilms, of course, can be home to high mortality, opportunistic pathogens that can cause severe disease in people who are immunocompromised, older, or who have underlying lung disease. Next slide, please. For the purposes of this analysis, we considered four diseases to be biofilm associated. And those were non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection, Legionnaire's disease, Pseudomonas pneumonia, and Pseudomonas septicemia. Next slide, please. 70% of hospital stays in our estimate were due to biofilm associated diseases. Next slide, please. Similarly, among the seven thousand deaths due to waterborne disease each year. Next slide, please. Ooh, looks like the numbers got a little bit messed up here, but 94% um, of the deaths were due to the four biofilm associated diseases. And finally, next slide, please. Moving to costs. Next slide, please. We found that hospital stays and emergency department visits for waterborne disease cost more than $3 billion annually in out-of-pocket and insurer payments, and that includes $1.4 billion in payments from Medicare and Medicaid. Next slide, please. And 78% of those costs were due to the four biofilm-associated diseases. Next slide, please. So when we look at all of the outcomes together, you can see that the share of biofilm associated rises among the more severe outcomes. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna pause here and I'll just say that that was a quick overview of our waterborne disease burden results. And you can see that we saw a pretty substantial burden of waterborne disease and that most of the severe outcomes are due to pathogens that have an affinity for biofilms. Next slide, please. Moving to our conclusions. Next slide, please. I hope that we've demonstrated that waterborne disease is indeed still present in the United States and that it looks a little bit different from the Oregon Trail mental picture that many people have. Next slide. Instead, we're thinking of the new frontier as biofilms, whether they're lurking in premise plumbing, HVAC systems or recreational water venues. Next slide, please. So I hope that this has demonstrated the ways in which water isn't just part of our natural ecosystem, but also part of our built environment. And in particular, this work contributes to the growing appreciation that the water in our pipes and buildings requires maintenance so that the health of the built environment can support the health of the people in the buildings. Next slide, please. So that was a quick look at how we're using a One Health lens to look at the topic of biofilm associated pathogens and waterborne disease. Next slide, please. And I'll close with two ways that we're moving ahead with this new understanding of the importance of biofilms. Our CDC Legionnaires disease colleagues have developed materials to help building managers develop water management programs. And we recently launched our first website with recommendations for what people can do at home to prevent biofilm associated illness. Um, and probably the easiest way to get to that web page with the link below is just to Google pre uh, preventing waterborne germs at home and it should come right up. Next slide, please. 
So I just wanted to acknowledge the many, many people that contributed to this work um, and to just say that good collaborators are almost as necessary in life as clean water. So thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation, the Global One Health Education Movement is by Dr. Deborah Thompson. You can move, yep, thank you. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Dream come true. I've been a big fan of Zohu Calls for a while now. So thank you again. Um, nice to meet you all. I'm Dr. Deborah Thompson. I'm the founder and president of One Health Lessons, which is an organization that aims to inspire students of all different ages around the world to value One Health. And I am a veterinarian, but before being a veterinarian, I was teaching in primary schools, secondary schools, and I was also teaching adults. Next slide, please. I wanted to talk to you about a real life story that's been happening for a little bit and it's going to continue to happen. And I would love for you to be a part of this story as well. This story is about One Health Lessons and particularly the COVID-19 focus One Health Lesson. Next slide, please. On May 1st of 2020, OneHealthLessons.com was built. It was launched. And within two weeks, I put out an announcement on social media that I'm looking for any volunteer out there who's willing or able to possibly translate one of the COVID-19 lessons into any other language. It would be greatly appreciated. Well, that message went out in mid-May out onto social media. And I am pleased to say that right now, the seven different age appropriate lessons about COVID-19, those are being translated today into 81 different languages. This is because of volunteers around the world. They value what One Health is and they want to inspire the next generation to see the world as one. Next slide, please. Now the COVID-19 lesson has several components to it. And the way I created these lessons is I had them be very specific to the target age group. These lessons are taught to students as young as six years old. Technically, I've heard of people teaching four-year-olds the six-year-old lesson, but of course you'd have to modify it just a touch. So the way I say that these lessons are built, they're built for students as young as six and as old as 106. The lessons teach where the virus likely came from, how can we protect ourselves today, just like what's on this slide right now, what can scientists of all different backgrounds through the One Health approach do to protect families in the future, what are vaccines, why are they important, and also what are mutations. And you can see here that these lessons are taught virtually, but they can also be taught in person. And I did this on purpose. I created these lessons on a PowerPoint format that can be downloaded from the website onehealthlessons.com because I understood that in order to really get the message out there, we have to get everybody involved. And that's regardless of their access to electricity, access to internet. So these are printable lessons and they are meant to be interactive. Next slide, please. Another important concept when it comes down to where this virus likely came from, SARS-CoV-2, well, we have to talk about the animal-human interface, right? And there are a lot of people out there who think, okay, well, this came from bats, so that therefore we should, you know, take care of the bats and not, um, not have them live. But that is not a good idea because when you get rid of bats in many, in many situations, in many ecosystems, the entire ecosystem falls apart, right? They could be keystone species. Bats are pollinators. Bats can, can um, distribute seeds. Uh, they can eat insects that are uh, important for vector-borne diseases. So bats are incredibly important. It's just that we need to respect our distance and respect that natural, um, distance between our habitat and theirs. Next slide, please. And this is how we explain biodiversity and how biodiversity can influence our own health. 
the original slide is one that is just trees and animals. And after a while, people are coming along and there are less trees. It can be because, of course, um, because people need trees for timber. It could be because of climate change and these uh, trees are just not supported. Well, either way, when there's deforestation for one reason or another, there's gonna be increased competition for food and shelter. That of course increases the stress level of animals and therefore these animals are sh perhaps showing more signs of illness. Well, that's more of a concern when these animals are leaving the degrading forest and meeting people. Next, uh, two clicks, please. And we demonstrate with students of all different ages Say, for instance, because of climate change or because the competition is just too much, all of the birds leave this forest. Next slide, please. There are going to be several consequences. Number one, there are less trees. Why? Because these birds could be pollinators and they could be helping the regrowth of forests. Well, they're not here anymore. There could be more rodents. Why? Because some of these birds have been eating rodents. And now that the predator is gone, the prey population flourishes. Now look at the other predator on the screen, foxes. And now look at how many animals are right near people. Because the other option is to stay in that degrading forest, but they have to, they have to look for food and shelter. And then we have a conversation with students of what's a zoonotic disease? And why is this situation not very good? Um, and you know what? The six-year-olds get it. They understand. And they understand that our everyday actions can play a role in not only our own health, but the environmental health and animal health and plant health. Next slide, please. And you can see these lessons are being taught around the world. This is a, this is a photo of children in Nigeria. But you can see the exact same type of photo with students in California. Next slide, please. And again, this um, COVID-19 lessons focuses on really what is One Health? Yes, sure, it's that interconnection between our health and the health of the environment, animals and plants, but it's also that approach, right? The One Health approach. And what's one word to describe that approach? It's teamwork. And that's what I get the students to understand and to remember, it's teamwork. It's teamwork between people of various strengths, various backgrounds, and we all work together to solve complicated problems, such as say, making a vaccine in record time. Next slide, please. Now, here's where you can come in. We have 81 languages in process right now for these lesson translations, and that includes American Sign Language. If you speak, or if you can sign American Sign Language, please let us know. If you want to contribute to translated in, translating into um, a language that um, you are familiar with, but um, it's not typically spoken in the United States, that's totally fine. Just let us know. The whole point of teaching children and adults in the language that's spoken at home is because we really want them to care. We really want them to care about the importance of One Health. And the best way to do it is meet the needs in the community. The other thing is, and I've seen this over and over again, when you teach children, you also teach their parents because the children tell their parents what they learned. From there, you can teach neighborhoods, you can teach communities, and from there, you can change society. And then from there, of course, you can change policies. Now, let's see what other avenue you can um, pursue in order to contribute to this global One Health education movement. Next slide, please. It's called the Certified Lesson Leaders Program and is consistent of four different hours. Each hour is, um, is based on your own schedule, but the first hour is really an orientation session. You do not need to be a teacher to be a part of this lesson leaders program. You just have to value One Health and be at least 18 years old. Again, this orientation session teaches you, the volunteer, to how to speak with six-year-olds and 16-year-olds because you can imagine that's a big difference. Next slide, please. 
Then you watch an entire One Health Lessons on the YouTube channel. And if you're curious about the YouTube channel, just type in One Health Lessons on YouTube and you'll find it. There you watch a YouTube um, lesson where I speak with children of various age groups and then you have to pass with 100% a quiz that's associated with that lesson. Thank you, next slide. Then you observe a live lesson being taught. Right now we have partnered up with an organization that's associated with University of California at Berkeley and they have outreach to 1700 classrooms. The other thing I wanted to mention here is that if we're going to explain One Health to a six-year-old, we have to use very simple language. And we say it's that connection between animal health, human health, and environmental health. But keep in mind, I have a picture of the tree in environmental health. We also explain what is the environment. It's your surroundings, right? So it's not necessarily plants. And we say that plants are also incredibly important for the One Health approach and the One Health concept. Um, but really, it's just like what we were saying before, water, right? That's involved in environmental health and clean water. Next slide, please. Last but not least, to become a certified lesson leader with One Health Lessons, you need to teach a lesson. And you have an assistant helping you teach that lesson. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the beautiful thing with the Certified Lesson Leaders Program is that it doesn't stop there. The whole point of this Lesson Leaders Program is to bring the message home, right? And right now with those 81 different languages in process, these lessons will be able to go in a lot of different countries, in a lot of different communities. And that's thanks to the wonderful volunteers of all different backgrounds somewhere around the world caring about this. So in that last step, next slide, please. Step number six, that's for the One Health Lessons Ambassadors. And as long as you teach five times in your own community, in your own first language, then you become a One Health Lessons Ambassador. And that gives you the privilege to then teach others in your community how to teach these lessons. And that way we no longer rely on bilingual people. We have cultural sensitivities built in there because the people teaching are from that community. Next slide, please. So if you're interested, and next slide, please, in joining um, this One Health educational movement, please um, contact lessonleadersprogram at gmail.com. And there's more information on the website, onehealthlessons.com. Next slide, please. And again, the future of One Health is global. Did you know that children in the United States right now, they don't only speak English. There was a statistic that I read recently that there are about 30 different languages involved in the United States alone. So you might see originally that these translations are good for the world, but they're also good for your own community and your own state in the United States. It really affects everybody everywhere. Now for the remainder of this um, presentation, I just wanted to share with you for a few seconds, photos from the classroom. Next slide, please. And these are photos taken. You can see that I'm clearly not an artist, but the students are interpreting the concept of One Health in various ways. Next slide, please. Here's a photo of teaching about clean water and the importance of clean water in an underserved classroom that is in the United States. Next slide, please. This is a photo of homeschooling happening in the United States. I believe um, the mother told me that one of these girls is uh, seven years old and the other one is 11 years old. Next slide, please. This is taken from a camp where I was teaching in 2018, talking about zoonotic diseases. And these children were five and six year olds and you could see that they're clearly interested. Next slide, please. These lessons also value the importance of taking action and changing, changing our everyday actions and how can we properly clean our hands, right? These lessons teach that. Next slide, please. This is taken in Nigeria fairly recently at the end of January. And this person was teaching about 50 students. You'll see them shortly. Next slide, please. This was taken in Ethiopia, where masters of public health students were learning about science communication through teaching children about One Health. 
with the One Health Lessons program. Next slide, please. This was taken in Kampala, Uganda at a community event where we were talking about protecting and valuing clean water as well as the One Health and COVID-19 lesson. Next slide, please. This is back in Nigeria. You could see that these, these students are very involved in their learning. It's meant to be interactive. Next slide, please. We try to get the kids to compete, to laugh, to have fun, because otherwise, how else are they going to remember what they've learned and also tell their parents about what they learned? Next slide, please. This is the 50 person classroom in Nigeria. Can you imagine all of these people now know the term One Health and what impact can that have on the community? Next slide, please. Now we're jumping over to Peru. These students were around eight to 11 years old. Next slide, please. You can see the importance of translating these lessons from English to Spanish. Next slide. You can see that these lessons are colorful. Next slide, please. And it, it inspires kids and students of all different ages to learn something new. Next slide, please. Now, One Health lessons have been taught around the world and including in this community up in the highest mountains in Peru. So you can say that One Health has touched the sky. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for your attention. I am very happy to connect with you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Our final presentation, National Wastewater Surveillance System Science to Implementation is by Dr. Amy Kirby. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Um, so what I want to do today is give you a quick overview of the National Wastewater Surveillance System or NWSS, which you'll hear me refer to as NEWS, um, and how we have stood this up to support uh, the COVID response and how we think this will be a longstanding surveillance platform for multiple pathogens going forward. Next slide. So wastewater surveillance um, was initially thought of as a, as a potential for uh, COVID surveillance because very early on we realized that about 50% of people that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 will shed detectable uh, viral RNA in their stool. Um, this happens very early during the course of infection and it happens irrespective of symptoms. So um, people that develop symptoms, people that are pre-symptomatic, and people that are completely asymptomatic will all shed uh, viral RNA in their stool. And we know this happens in adults and children. Um, so a very broad marker of infection. Um, and while we know many of those people will not seek um, any clinical care, the vast majority of them um, will be using the bathroom. And in about 75% of US households, um, those toilets are connected to sewer systems that transport that waste very efficiently um, and quickly within a matter of hours to a wastewater treatment plant. And so what that means is that the, the wastewater coming into treatment plants can be treated like a pooled community stool sample. And so with just one sample, um, we can get information that represents hundreds, thousands, even millions of individuals um, that are living in uh, that sewer catchment. And we call that a sewer shed. Um, we also really like this approach because again, it captures those subclinical infections. Um, and so we're seeing uh, this is a way to systematically uh, uh, measure asymptomatic infections, which we don't otherwise get through our clinical surveillance systems. One of the reasons that I particularly really like wastewater surveillance is that it is independent of healthcare seeking behavior. So again, it doesn't matter if you go to the doctor, it doesn't matter if you have healthcare access, the testing capacity um, in your local community, none of that is going to impact the data uh, that we get from wastewater surveillance. And that has huge impacts on our clinical surveillance. Um, and so we have a robust data set um, that is totally separate from those uh, factors. And finally, this can be really quick. Um, the data uh, can be available within days of the onset of viral shedding. So that's gonna happen quickly. Again, just a few hours to get that sample 
um, to a wastewater treatment plant. We collect the sample, test it in a lab. Um, the turnaround there is about 24 to 36 hours. And so we can have data in hand from wastewater um, within a week um, or less um, compared to about a two week lag um, for other clinical indicators. Next slide. So I just wanna give you a little bit of an overview of um, sort of the statistical proof um, that wastewater surveillance is giving us an, an accurate measure of what's going on in the community. So this is data from a sewer shed in the Midwest. Um, the slide on the left, you can think of as the raw data. So that uh, the gray bars are daily case counts from that sewer shed. The red line um, is the wastewater data from that same sewer shed. <clears throat> and this is a million copies of uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA per liter of wastewater um, per capita. Um, so we control for the number of people that are um, contributing to any given sample. And so you can see that both of them go up and down. There's um, some noise, there's some evidence of uh, some trends there, but it's hard to see a strong alignment between the two data sets. Um, and that is what we did with the graph on the right. Um, so this is a st statistical correlation of both the trends. So when wastewater goes up, our case is going up. Um, and when one goes down, is the other going down? And the timing of those trends. So the y-axis, you can it, label directional agreement. And that is basically, do the trends align? Are they both going up? Are they both going down? Or are they going in different directions? Higher scores indicate greater agreement. And then the x-axis is telling us about the relationship between those over time. And so basically what we did is we took that wastewater data and started offsetting it by a certain number of days from the case data. So the zero on the x-axis is showing the relationship you see in the graph on the left. So with no offset, we see, you know, basically random. Um, relationship between the two. It's 50-50 whether or not the trends agree. Um, but as we start offsetting um, those uh, data sets over time, we see increasing agreement until we get this peak um, at six days. So this is looking at the black line there. Um, so what this tells us is that in this sewer shed, the wastewater data trends are leading case data by six days. Um, which is huge um, in COVID time. We do see that um, time lag vary. It can be as short as two days or as long as two weeks. Um, and that variance in the lag um, we think is linked to how well clinical surveillance is performing. So when your clinical surveillance and testing is working really well, wastewater data only gives you a very short advantage. When clinical surveillance is compromised, we see wastewater surveillance giving you a longer lag or longer lead time, I should say. Next slide. So with that in hand, um, we decided to stand up the National Wastewater Surveillance System to provide some support um, for this approach. Um, our primary um, node of, uh, of contact um, is with the health department because they are the end user of this data. Um, a lot of the <clears throat> activities around wastewater surveillance initially started with utilities and academic laboratory partners, which are great, but they weren't getting the data to the health departments effectively. And oftentimes we were finding that the health department was completely in the dark about what was going on. And so we wanted them to be engaged at all steps. Um, and so our activity works through them. And then the health departments reach out to their utilities um, and bring them into the network and then coordinate laboratory testing as well. Um, laboratory testing right now is a mix of commercial laboratories, academic laboratories, and a few public health labs um, are able to do this uh, testing. Next slide. The heart of the news system is really our Decipher data dashboard. So Decipher is our surveillance platform here at CDC. It stands for Data Collation and Integration for Public Health and Emergency Response, or Public Health Emergency Response. Um, and so that is the platform that we used um, to build this data dashboard. It can receive the data, um, normalize it for method performance. There's lots of methods being used, laboratory performance. Um, it can normalize it for changes in sewage composition. Um, as you might imagine, um, the sewage uh, is different from different um, communities and it can be different 
over the course of a day. Um, lots more human input during the day than we have at night, for example. Um, and it can also be uh, diluted by things like rainfall. So we wanna be able to account for that. Um, and so it brings all of that in, it normalizes all of the results so that the data is comparable across jurisdictions, regardless of um, any of those other characteristics. And then <clears throat> it assigns a trend classification. Um, so again, we really emphasize that trends are more important than absolute numbers. And so it uses linear regression to identify whether um, the sewage uh, concentrations are increasing, decreasing, or plateaued. If those trends um, are maintained over five consecutive data points, we consider them sustained. Um, and so, and then we report all of that data back to our health department partners, and that's what you're seeing here. So panel number one is showing all of that on a map, so you can see all of the treatment plants that are under surveillance. The dots are color-coded by their current status. Um, this was not a good period for the state of Ohio, so they had a lot of um, utility plants that were either red um, and sustained increase or plateaued um, in yellow. If you want to dive deeper into the data, you can do that with panel number two. Um, so this is a time series graph of the data for each individual site. Um, the black dots and lines are the sewage data. The gray bars um, are the sewer shed level case data. So we only want to look at the cases that are relevant to that particular sewer system. Um, and so we have to bring in that uh, modified data set. And then along the bottom of each of those is a color-coded bar graph that gives you the trend status of that, um, that sewer shed over time. We also have a couple of quick glance options. So number three is our trend classification grid. So you can just quickly see um, how all of your treatment plants are performing. Um, again, we see most are either sustained increase or plateaued at this time. Um, and then uh, number four is our alerts list. Um, and so this is triggered whenever the most recent value is higher than would be expected from the previous uh, three values. It triggers that alert. Um, we don't intend that to be a trigger for public health action necessarily, but we do intend for that to be a trigger for our health department partners to look more closely into that data point. Um, is it potentially a lab error or is there something going on in that sewer shed that might explain it um, or is it something that needs to be interrogated more deeply and, and perhaps um, a cause for concern. Next slide. Uh, like any surveillance method, wastewater surveillance has limitations. Um, the first is that not all of our households are on sewer systems. So about 25% um, of U.S. residences are not connected to the sewer um, and that is not uh, distributed evenly across the U.S. Most of our non-sewered households are in rural areas. Um, and so this approach is going to uh, favor urban regions over rural regions. Um, we also see an increasing trend in a lot of large facilities bringing on on-site wastewater treatment or decentralized wastewater treatment. So instead of sending their waste into the um, wastewater system, they're just treating it on their own location um, and have a discharge permit from EPA. Um, so those will also not be picked up, and those sites are commonly uh, universities and correctional facilities. So it's important to know whether they are um, part of the signal that you're getting. We also know with any environmental microbiology test, negative results are not interpretable. It could always be that we did not sample a large enough volume, that there was something in the sample that was um, interfering with our test method. It could be that we didn't sample at exactly the right time and we missed the contamination. Um, and so we do not um, put any interpretive value on negatives, which can be um, really counterintuitive to people. If we think that a positive is meaningful, why is a negative also not meaningful? Um, and basically all we can say is that um, the, the infection levels in this community are below the, the level of detection. Um, so you cannot say that a community is free, totally free of infection this way. Um, and finally, we know that some of the operational characteristics um, in sewage treatment plants um, can impact testing. So you want to know about that um, and, and what's being used in your utility. Next slide. This system um, brings together unique stakeholders that haven't naturally been part um, of disease surveillance efforts. Um, and we've had to bring them up to speed very quickly. Um, and we've realized that they have very different needs and interests. And so to address that, we established three communities of practice. Um, there's one for our health department partners that's led by CDC. 
that's very focused on the data coordination and submission, as well as data interpretation and response needs. Um, we have a second one uh, focused on our laboratories that's run by the Association of Public Health Laboratories. Um, as you can imagine, that's very focused on test methods, protocol development, data comparability, quality assurance and quality control, and biosafety issues. Um, and then finally, we have one for our utility partners. Um, that one is hosted by the Water Environment Federation. They focus on sampling methods, um, as well as understanding the operational characteristics of a utility that can impact um, this type of surveillance so that they can be um, really engaged and useful partners with their um, public health colleagues. Um, and then they also have a lot of interest in worker safety issues as well. Next slide. I get a lot of questions about the potential for variant tracking in wastewater. Um, it's early days yet, but we think it is very promising for variant detection and tracking. So if you know there's a variant of concern, wastewater sequencing can help you um, understand how widely distributed it is, but it's going not likely to be useful for variant discovery. So finding that new one that will become a variant of concern. Um, we are currently working uh, to evaluate data on this and, and understand if it can be used to inform our public health uh, response. So stay tuned for more information on that. Next slide. Finally, I just want to quickly touch on um, the future of news beyond COVID. Um, we really developed this to be a flexible surveillance platform for multiple health targets. Many pathogens um, are shed in stool, and so we have the potential to detect them and track them this way. Um, we have also built this infrastructure to be really nimble and rapidly adaptable to changing public health needs. So we can quickly um, work with our laboratory partners and our public health department uh, partners to bring on a new pathogen um, if there uh, is uh, a need for that. Um, the most, uh, the targets that are most likely to be um, incorporated into the news platform in the near future uh, include antibiotic resistance uh, genes and organisms, enteric infections like norovirus and E. coli 0157 and salmonella, um, as well as influenza, which has a lot of similarities um, to COVID. And I believe that is my last slide. Next. Yes. Happy to turn it back over to you, Laura. Great. Thank you. And thanks to all of today's speakers for their informative presentations. We do have some time for questions. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send your questions and include the presenter's name or topic. Um, and Dr. Kirby, we do have a question for you. How many communities are implementing the wastewater surveillance? Yeah, so through news at CDC, we have 180 utilities that are uh, have data regularly being submitted into news from uh, five partner states. Um, but we know that there's a lot of other efforts happening at the state level. Um, and so we're working to bring those um, into the news platform as well. So we expect it to grow rapidly over the next few months. Great, thank you. Um, and then do you have a question for our first presenter? Are there demographic differences in incidence of waterborne disease? Hi there, yes, thank you for that question. Yes, there are demographic differences. Uh, this work did not look at demographic differences. It just constructed a national estimate for everyone in the US. But yes, absolutely, your risk for waterborne disease um, differs by age, by race and ethnicity, by whether you live in a rural area or an urban area, et cetera. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and there is a question for Dr. Thompson. With the fourth step for the One Health Lesson Leader certification, would we need to find our own classroom or would the assistant and the classroom be provided? Good question. The assistant and the uh, classroom would be provided because we are connected with the community outreach program that's associated with UC Berkeley called Community Resources for Science. So um, that's taken care of. But at the point of a One Health Lessons Ambassador, that's where um, you take it upon yourself to find the right avenues to get into your own communities. Great question. Thank you. And another question for Dr. Kirby, is there any evidence that SARS-CoV-2 can be spread via aerosolized wastewater for land survey, uh, such as in inhaling steam when opening sanitary manhole covers for land surveyors, construction workers, and others? Yeah, that's a great question and something we've been really interested in from the very beginning. Um, there is um, 
increasing evidence that the vast majority of what we are detecting in stool and also wastewater is non-infectious virus. Um, there have been some limited reports of isolation of infectious virus from stool, um, but they're very small, one sample from one patient. Um, and the larger studies uh, are more likely to report <clears throat> um, failure to recover infectious virus. So while we can't totally rule out the possibility, we think the risk is very, very small um, from wastewater. We have not seen um, any outbreaks that you might suspect, um, for example, in wastewater workers. Um, in fact, we commissioned a study with the University of South Carolina to ask that question directly, um, and they are reporting no excess risk among wastewater workers compared to their risk in co the community um, for transmission that way. Um, so, um, the end result is, is we think that risk is, is quite low um, and would really only uh, happen with concentrated wastewater um, like you might have in laboratories. Great, thank you. We have another question for Dr. Thompson. Um, are you currently partnered with any public health agencies in the U.S.? Not yet, but we would love to. Great, thanks. And another question for Dr. Kirby, what variables in the water or infrastructure affect quantity and persistence of detectable SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid in wastewater? That is an excellent question and one that we really don't have great answers to. Um, we do see fluctuation that correlates with flow, um, which is not terribly surprising, um, but we really don't understand how biofilms might impact it um, or other uh, aspects like that. There have been some studies suggesting that it does not survive long in wastewater once it is there. Um, so we think the signal that we're detecting is uh, representing cases that are currently active in the community. So there's not a concern about a long tail um, of signal surviving in the wastewater. Thank you. And then there's one more question for you, Dr. Kirby. How long are people shedding the virus to be detected in the wastewater? Do they shed from before they have symptoms until the sickness resolves? Yeah, it's actually a really interesting um, shedding dynamic in these patients. So within a couple of days of infection, um, they start shedding in stool at very high concentrations, 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th copies per mil of stool, which is what we would see with things like norovirus. Um, and that really high level of shedding continues for about four to five days. And then it drops considerably down to about 10 to the 3rd or 10 to the 4th copies per mil of stool. And that low level of shedding can continue for a couple of weeks. Great, thank you. And thanks to everybody for the great questions. If you have other questions for today's presenters, we've included their email addresses on this slide on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. A video of today's webinar will be posted um, within 30 days. Next slide. And please join us for the next Sohu call on April 7th, 2021. Thank you for your participation. This ends today's webinar.